What's going on guys, welcome to Final Fantasy XIV, the critically acclaimed MMORPG from Square Enix. Today I'm going to be doing a refreshed 2024 complete beginner's guide and show you the best things to do in the opening acts of the game, as well as some recommendations for your settings and some general best practice tips overall, as the game doesn't do a 100% perfect job of explaining everything to new players. Now these tips are not in any particular order, for example the last tip, number 19, is critically important to new players who want to play online with their friends in the same server without having to pay any money so please bear with me and try and make it through the video and I guarantee you'll learn at least one new thing. Now I want to thank my viewers as well as I only have a small channel with around 250 subs and somehow my last guide got over 26,000 views. I have no idea how that happened but I'm really grateful for it. I've got many other Final Fantasy 14 tutorials on the channel so check them out. So what's new since my last beginner's guide video back in 2023? Well, quite a lot as it happens. So this guide has been made effectively to replace my older video and will include all of those previous tips and more. Now to start off, we need to say a big welcome and hello to the entire Xbox community starting from March 21st, 2024 for its full official release after the successful recent beta period. Now the game has been PlayStation, PC and Mac exclusive since its launch way back in 2013 with currently around 52 million million active subscribers and 1 million daily active players. And finally now the full release will be going ahead for Xbox on March 21st, making the overall community even bigger. I have been playing since 2014 and the game's always been active as you can see behind me here, and I can't wait to go full crossplay with my friends over on Xbox. There's also never been a better time to play as since my other video, the free trial of the game has now been expanded by an entire DLC expansion pack. Now, as part of the free trial, you'll get all of the base game, known as Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn, all of the first award-winning expansion pack, known as Heaven's Ward, and all of the second expansion pack, known as Stormblood. And the trial is not time-limited, so you'll be able to play as long as you like, even if you complete the story and reach max level 70. You just won't be able to unlock the next expansions, Shadowbringers, and then Endwalker, and get to level 90, the current max level. Honestly, it's pretty insane that all of the content is free, considering there's literally hundreds of hours of gameplay there available for you without paying a penny. Furthermore, Square Enix has also announced a brand new expansion scheduled to be released in summer 2024, known as Dawn Trail. There's also a game-wide graphical texture update to come with it. The game just keeps getting bigger and better, and I'm all for it. Anyway, let's begin with the video. Number one, quest types. So we'll start off by talking about the quests that you should be focusing on in this game. Now there are over 820 important quests in the game that you'll need to do to unlock new content and so on. Yes, the game is that huge. Now when I first started Final Fantasy XIV, I thought I was supposed to just go up to any old gold marker to start the quest and I'd be well on my way to becoming strong, but that's not how this game works. There are in fact three types of quest markers that you will see most often that you need to pay attention to. Now the most important one you should follow is the main story quest icons. These look like a normal quest icon with a fireball around them and these will reward you with the most amount of XP and guilt compared to any other quest type in the game and it will also move you on to unlocking new game content in the correct order. Now the second icons are the important side quest icons. So what these are, they look like a regular normal quest icon, but instead they are filled in with blue and they have a plus symbol on the side. Now what these are, they signify that it's a quest that will give you a significant reward or unlock a new game mechanic when completed. So it's important that you take all of these that you do come across. And there are several of the game's core mechanics that are locked behind these types of quests, uh, such as the challenge log, which can reward you with a ton of money and XP in the future. Now the next type of quest to talk about today is the generic side quests. These are just standard golden icons with nothing really fancy about them and what I can tell you is do not waste your time with doing these quests. They reward the smallest and tiniest amount of gil and XP, don't bear any significance to the progress of the game and they really only serve as filler content. So when this game is hundreds of hours long anyway, it's probably recommended not to do these types of quests anyway when you don't really need to. Now it does force you to do a couple of these starter quests at the very beginning of the game kind of as part of the tutorial there around level 5 um, and you'll need to do them to get some more money so you can buy a new set of armor to start out but after that you don't need to do them any longer so really pay these no attention. Now the final type of quest to talk about here today are the class specific job quests so it's important that you definitely do these. Now every so often under the main scenario quest reminder box you're going to see smaller orange quest icons. 
Now, as I mentioned before, they're class-specific quests, so they're to do specifically with the class you chose at the character creation screen. Now, by completing these quests, you're unlocking new actions and moves for your character, making them stronger. So I definitely recommend doing them when they become available, and they actually become available in line with the main scenario quest progress. So this is why it's important to progress with the main story at the same time. Number two, take time to learn the basics. So yes, this game is absolutely huge and you're likely here to stay a while. So you may as well invest at least five minutes into learning the basics of what you're doing. And a lot of newer players at first struggle to understand the basic map system. So to simply understand the map system, we have to look at the map. So let's press start, go to travel and click on map. Now this is the local area map. On PlayStation, if I hit triangle, I can change the type of map. So this is the local map. This is the regional map. And this is the world map. Now let's say I want to move from this location into a completely different area because there's a quest in a separate area. If you look on the map and take a look around, you can see these smaller triangles here. Now what these represent are adjoining areas, so they're going to take us to a different area of the map. Now we know that we're in Limsa Lamincer Lower Decks, as it says there on the map, and this is taking us to Middle Lenosia. Now we can actually click on that green triangle to see what the adjoining area is. And there you have it, this is the adjoining area, so you may have a separate quest over in this place in Summerford Farms. Now on PlayStation, you can hit square to quickly bring up your map. If you start moving, it will blend it transparently in the background so you can see exactly what you're doing. Now we're approaching the green triangle for the adjoining area, and in real life in the gameplay you will see a couple of blue dots to indicate you're approaching the adjoining area, and as you pass through it, you'll get a load screen and it will confirm you're in a new area. If you have an active quest, you can select it from the hood to find out where it is. So in this case, just click the touchpad on PlayStation until your finger is clicking on the exact quest. Select it, it will take you to the journal, and then select map, and you will see there, it's in Costa del Sol. If you've not yet unlocked Costa del Sol, you can clearly see the adjoining areas for Eastern Lenosia are here, so you'll know exactly where to cross the borders. So it's actually really important at the start of the game as well to set up your hotbar the way you want it. You will have this crossbar at the bottom of the screen and at the beginning of the game it will most likely be empty. So it's up to you to set it up. So to set it up, hit the start button, go to actions and traits and you will see here your class actions. Now these are all the moves that you will have that you'll be able to use as long as you're the right level. So it's definitely worth that you take a look at what your character can do and what level he unlocks them. It's also really important to have a look at the other options here as well as there are a couple over in roll and it's really important to check out general as your general commands here such as sprint and teleport are here and also there's a really key one here called limit break which is essential for when you're doing dungeons at level 15 and you need to know how to execute a large attack, defense or heal depending on what class you are. This is something that a lot of players overlook and it's really important in the game. Number three, don't worry too much about the starting areas. So you'll start this game in one of three starting areas depending on which class you chose. The areas are Lenosia, which will take you to the starting city Limsa Laminsa. You then have the Black Shroud, which takes you to the starting city New Gridania. And finally, there is the Fanalan area, which takes you to the main city of Uldar. But at level 15, as part of the main story quest, the game takes you on a tour to all of the three cities anyway, allows you to tune to the Aoife rights for fast travel for each area. So within the first couple of hours of the game, it no longer matters which area you started in. Number four, always attuned to Aetherites and Shards. Now, I can't tell you how many players visit the new game city areas at level 15 and forget to tune to the Aetherites. Now, if you do this, you won't be able to fast travel back to that location and it is a pain in the ass. So make sure you absolutely do attune to every crystal that you see in this game. Now, when that is completed, you want to do a walk around the entire area and attune yourself to the smaller shards that you see as that will allow internal free fast travel in that area. Number five, HUD customization. So the amount of customization you can do on the HUD in this game is crazy. You can pretty much change the layout of everything, change its size and move anything to the opposite side of the screen. Uh, when I first started Final Fantasy XIV, a couple of my things were overlapping each other and I really wanted to fix it. So you can do that pretty easily. So to do this, we just hit the start button, scroll over to system and go to HUD layout. Now we can see here on the drop down for current UI element, we can choose any of the things on the screen. So let's find the duty list. Now we can just move it down and out the way. We can even hide it if we want to. Change the size. And make sure it's in the right place and just click save when you're done.
Now, another thing that's really frustrating and doesn't really get explained to anyone in this game is the inventory dot display. Now, down in the bottom right corner, you can see a whole bunch of dots with no real explanation or meaning as to what they are. But what that actually is, is a visual representation of your inventory slots. So if we hit start, go to inventory, you can clearly see it accurately reflects my first page of the inventory. All the other pages are blank, so that's why they're just grayed out dots. Again, we don't need this, so to get rid of it, just hit start. Scroll over to system and go into character configuration. Go to UI settings, move over to the HUD and uncheck display inventory grid. Make sure you apply that and close it out. Number six, making weapon and armor gear sets. So another thing I feel the game doesn't really explain very well is your character's gear and how to make gear sets. So you will likely at some point want to take on a different role in the game and have a way to be able to quickly switch between the roles, uh, kind of without having to equip and <laughs> unequip every single piece of armor and weaponry. So thankfully there is a way to quickly do that. Um, so as you can see here, I am a summoner class. Uh, maybe I want to switch over to another class. All I need to do is go into weapon selection and select the main hand for the job or class that I want to do. So for example, if I want to be a culinarian, I would click on this weathered skillet here and it would quickly switch over to that class. Now, once that is selected, you can see it stripped me of all my summoner clothing and gear and changed my active job. If I want to register the culinarian now as an active gear set, I'll simply need to click on gear set list and move up into the corner onto the plus symbol. Now it will register this as a new gear set. So to save this gear set in the future, if I make any changes, I just need to synchronize the gear set with this button here. So if I add on a piece of clothing and click synchronize, it will now be part of the gear set. Now to change back to summoner, I go back to gear set list and click on summoner and there you have it. Another cool thing about this menu is the game automatically knows which piece of armor will be best for your character. So if I remove my body piece here and click on recommended gear, the game will automatically figure out the best piece of body armor in my inventory and I get the choice to equip it for me here. Now once this is done I just need to resync it to the gear set and I'm good to go. Number seven, item levels. So in this game, when you're looking at a piece of armor, you can see two different levels associated with every piece of armor and it can be a little bit confusing. So as you can see on the far right hand side of the screen here, there is a bunch of abbreviations in green, THM, ACN, blah, blah, blah. And what they are are abbreviations for the type of class that can wear this piece of armor. In this case, it's Firmitage, Arcanist, Black Mage, Summoner, Red Mage, and Blue Mage. The level 90 that's written underneath it is just the level requirement you need to be on your character in order to equip that piece. Now the item level is completely different. As you can see in the bottom left corner of the screen here, it says gear average item level 643. Now at some points in this game, the game will lock you out of certain pieces of content and say, well, you need to be an average item level of 650 in order to continue. So what I'll need to do is I'll need to get better pieces of armor in order to increase that level. And it's an average, so it means I'll need to upgrade my entire gear set to up the average. It's nothing too much to worry about in the early stages of the game, but it's important to know for the later stages. Number eight, side jobs. So a question I get asked a lot is, do the side jobs affect your progress in the main game? Well, the short answer to this is no. I myself would recommend that you acquire every side job in the game by completing its relevant blue icon quest and make a preset class for every one so you can revisit them later, but it doesn't actually impact the game whatsoever if you ignore them entirely. I actually completed the full game, got past Endwalker expansion, uh, and then stepped foot into leveling up the side jobs. And actually this made it significantly easier for me to level up those side jobs at that point, because then you will have access to XP boosters, the ability to fly pretty much everywhere in the world, and you'll have access to all the areas of the game. So you'll be able to get different materials that you need for leveling up the quests. Number nine, your class evolves at level 30 into a job. So as you know, at the beginning of the game, you choose a class. Well, at level 30 of the game, you actually get the option to evolve that class into a more powerful version known as a job. Now, for example, if you start as Arcanist class like I did, you can evolve it into the summoner job at level 30. If you start as the Marauder class at level 30, you can evolve it into a warrior job and so on. Now, you should absolutely take that route as the job enhances your character in several ways and it unlocks a ton of new abilities. Now, if you go into the actual 
actions and traits menu, you can see a list of all your class moves and what they do. But once you unlock your job and scroll down, you'll be able to see a list of all the extra things you will gain by accepting the newer job. And once you've hit level 30, you will get a class side quest with an orange icon under the main scenario quest, as I mentioned before. And when that's completed, it will reward you with a soul crystal. Just equip the soul crystal in the equipment screen and it will transform you into the new job. Don't forget to register that in your gear set list when you've done that. Number 10, always check your logs. Now in this game, there are two particularly important logs that you need to keep an eye on consistently. Now the first is the achievement log. Now what this is in the game, you're gonna complete several achievements that give you rewards such as mounts and minions, titles and other gear. Now sometimes when you complete an achievement and you get the notification in the bottom left corner on the text box, sometimes it doesn't always unlock straight away. You actually have to go into the achievement log and hit claim. Now, if you go into the achievement log, you can actually filter the achievements to see different ones with mounts, minions, titles, and so on to see if there's something you haven't yet claimed. Every week, it's worth checking it out and just to see if you've missed something. Now, by completing the achievements, you can also achieve achievement tokens and certificates, and you can take these to Jonathus, who is an NPC vendor in Old Gridania, and that's accessible from the start of the game for some players or at level 15 for those that didn't start in the area. Now, if you speak to this NPC, Jonathan, he's going to have a ton of things to sell you and he exchanges them for those achievement tokens and you can actually get some minions and mounts from this too and they're pretty cool. The other log to pay attention to is the challenge log. Now, at level 15, you will get one of those side quests, a blue marker with a plus symbol in that will unlock the challenge log. Now, this is incredibly important as it will reward you with huge amounts of gil, XP and gold saucer MGP currency. And this resets once a week, every Tuesday in Europe, it resets. So you can actually keep claiming the free rewards just for playing the game normally. If you complete five challenges, the log just gives you 10K of gil plus the rewards you receive for completing the individual challenges anyway. So for those who want to earn big money in the Gold Saucer Casino later in the game, this challenge log is a huge help as it can also reward MGP. Number 11, navigating the journal. So if you're like me and you don't want a screen full of text and crammed full of crap, you can hide your active quests. Simply go into the journal and highlight the quest you want to change. In my journal here, you can see the quest is available, but has a grayed out checkbox. This means it will display on the HUD, but is not my chosen active quest. I can change it to my active quest on PlayStation by hitting the square button, and as you'll see, it will get a yellow checkbox. This means it's now my active quest. Now, I can also hit square again to hide the quest entirely so it doesn't display on the HUD. Number 12, Inventory Management. Now, if you're like me and played a ton of Bethesda games, you've probably come into this game with a slight worry about being over the carry weight limit, or as Bethesda calls it, being over encumbered. Now, this is absolutely not a problem in Final Fantasy XIV, as when you have an item, it simply takes up one slot in your inventory, and it doesn't bear any of any numbered weight. You can access your inventory anytime in this game from the pause menu anywhere you are, and you can stack up to 99 of that particular item in your inventory in that one single slot. So you can hold an absolute ton of stuff. Even later on at level 15, when you unlock your first mount, the Chocobo, this gives you an additional 70 slots in the Chocobo saddlebag. And the saddlebag is also conveniently available on the pause menu. Number 13, offline XP gain in Sanctuary. So have you ever seen an orange XP bar inside your normal XP bar and wondered what the hell that was? Well, this is the game trying to reward you with free XP just for playing the game, but it only gives you it if you sign out in certain areas. So remember to always sign out of the game in these areas known as sanctuaries. And what these are, they tend to be areas with an etherite crystal. It will actually let you know in the chat box in the bottom left corner if you've entered or exited a sanctuary. Number 14, do not buy any armor or weapons from NPC vendors. It's absolutely key to say, do not waste your gill in the early stages of the game buying any weapons or armor, except for when you need to at level five in the tutorial. Now this game will reward you anyway with a ton of weapons and armor relative to the level of the quest you complete. So if you complete a level 20 quest, you'll be rewarded with a level 20 package that includes a level 20 gear, and this can be weapons and armor. So you don't need to waste any money in buying consistently upgrading your gear. Number 15, free or discounted fast travel. So you can actually get free fast travel in this game by registering an etherite as a home destination. All you have to do is go up to the etherite, click on set home point, and it'll set that for you. Now to actually return home, you just click start, go to travel, and then return. 
As you can see, you can only do this once every so often as there's a cooldown of around 14 to 15 minutes. To get discounted fast travel, just walk up to an etherite, select it, and click select favorite destination. Now, when you've got a favorite destination, what it does is give you 50% off the teleportation cost. Now, as you can see here by my selected destinations, I have one, two, three, four favorite destinations, and these are going to be at 50% fast travel cost. Now, the reason you can see a fifth one here at the top at Lenosia is because if you have a PlayStation Plus subscription, you're able to get a fifth one for free fast travel completely. So that is essentially a second home point. Number 16, make use of the market board. So if you do have the full version of the game, you will be able to access the market board. Unfortunately, it's not available on the trial. If you have a ton of spare gil available and you consider yourself rich and you want to get a new mount for a cheap cost, look no further. If you do a search for registerable miscellany items, you can find a ton of mounts in here. Now, it's far easier than buying them here on the market board than acquiring them naturally in the game. For example, the flying chair mount is actually acquired by getting an alchemist class all the way to level 80 and then crafting it. Or you can just buy it here for around 36k on the market board. So it's super useful if you're leveling up your side jobs as well because you can just buy all your materials here, also quite cheap. Number 17, use the Final Fantasy XIV wiki. So I'll add the link in the description for this one, but I can't stress enough how useful this guide is if you're having trouble doing anything at all in the game. There are plenty of times where I couldn't find a quest start location, or I just lost my place on what I was doing due to taking a break and returning to the game, and this wiki guide helps you along with that. I mainly used it to see how far along I was for a main story arc, or to see how much there was left of a certain expansion until I could reach the next one. Number 18, look at the chat box for help. So when you finally make it to a dungeon at level 15, you'll realise that this is where your chosen role matters. You're either going to play healer, DPS or tank depending on the path you chose and boy do people get mad if you don't play the role. Now there's nothing worse than a healer that doesn't heal or a tank that pulls enemies without stopping to let the DPS attack them. Now my advice is to check the chat box in the corner of the screen to see if anyone's there asking for help or maybe someone's giving you advice if you're repeatedly dying. And people on PC also set up some pretty hilarious macros for the chat so healers will automatically say things like sexual healing when they're resurrecting you. Number 19. Pick your world carefully. So ideally you want to pick the same world and data center that your friends are playing on. And if you don't do this, it does cause a lot of issues. You can visit your friends in other worlds for free, but you won't be able to join the same free company, which is basically a clan system, and you won't be able to get a house together as that uses the free company system. It's also a complete pain having to visit your friends' worlds in general, and if you want to permanently switch the worlds, there's a load of limitations on that too. For example, you can't permanently switch worlds if you're on the trial, and you can only move to certain worlds at a specific time, depending on how Square Enix considers the congestion of the server. Each world has a classification by Square Enix. A new world is called a new world, and an average world is called a standard world. But this is where it gets confusing. A busy server is called a congested world, and sometimes they don't accept player moves at all. Sometimes you have to pay £12 to perform the move. A server with less players is called a preferred world by Square Enix, and this should be free to move to. Anyway, all of this can just be avoided by choosing the same server as your mates to begin with. That's it for today guys, as I said at the start of the video, I have got a ton of other Final Fantasy content out there with tutorials for MGP farming in the Gold Saucer and Chocobo racing and breeding. Check out the channel guys and I'll see you in the next one.